Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Julia Chen. I am the Activities Director at the Yale Club, and I'm so excited to see so many of you joining us today for our virtual lecture series, where we bring in a live speaker to do a talk and a Q&A that you can participate in from your homes. So today we are excited to welcome George Packer, Class of 82. George is a staff writer at The Atlantic and the author of The Unwinding, An Inner History of the New America, which was a New, His New York Times bestseller and winner of the 2013 National Book Award. His other nonfiction books include The Assassin's Gate, America in Iraq, a finalist for the 2006 Pulitzer Prize, and Blood of the Liberals, winner of the 2001 Robert F. Kennedy Book Award. He is also the author of two novels and a play, Betrayed, winner of the 2008 Lucille Lortel Award, and the editor of a two-volume edition of the Essays of George Orwell. His new book, Our Man, Richard Holbrook and the End of the American Century, won the 2020 Los Angeles Times Book Award and was a finalist for the 2020 Pulitzer Prize. It has just been published in paperback, and you can check in the chat for a link later to purchase it. He is joining us today to speak about this book and on the brilliant, admired, and detested man that was Richard Holbrook. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, George. Thank you, Julia. Thanks for having me. And thank you all for coming in this strange way that we um, get together these days. Um, it doesn't quite satisfy because it's much better to see people and to talk to people face to face, but we can't do that. Um, and so I'm grateful to all of you for taking time out of your quarantine uh, and uh, tuning in to my talk. Um, the book is out in paperback as of yesterday. Here is a hot off the press copy um, and is available at uh, either Amazon or penguinrandomhouse.com or a, a website called bookshop.org, which is a great way to support independent bookstores around the country. Um, so I'm gonna start by reading a few pages from the prologue so you can get a feel for the book and for the prose, and then I'll talk about why and how I wrote it and what I think the book means and what it has to say to us today. So here goes from the prologue. Holbrook, yes, I knew him. I can't get his voice out of my head. I still hear it saying, you haven't read that book, you really need to read it, saying, I feel, and I hope this doesn't sound too self-satisfied, that in a very difficult situation where nobody has the answer, I at least know what the overall questions and moving parts are. Or saying, gotta go, Hillary's on the line. That voice, calm, nasal, a trace of older New York, a sing-song cadence when he was being playful, but always doing something to you cajoling, flattering, bullying, seducing, needling, analyzing, one-upping you, applying continuous pressure like a strong underwater current so that by the end of a conversation, even two minutes on the phone, you found yourself far out from where you'd started, unsure how you got there and mysteriously exhausted. He was six feet one, but seemed bigger. He had long skinny limbs and a barrel chest and broad square shoulder bones, on top of which sat his strangely small head and encased within it, the sleepless brain. His feet were so far from his trunk that as his body wore down and the blood stopped circulating properly, they swelled up and became marbled red and white like steak. He had special shoes made and carried extra socks in his leather attache case, sweating through half a dozen pairs a day, stripping them off on long flights and draping them over his seat pocket in first class, or else cramming used socks next to the classified documents in his briefcase. He wrote his book about ending the war in Bosnia, the place in history that he always craved, though it was never enough with his feet planted in a Brookstone Shiatsu foot massager. One morning, he showed up late for a meeting in the Secretary of State suite at the Waldorf Astoria in his stocking feet, shirt untucked and fly half zipped, padding around the room and picking grapes off a fruit basket, 
while Madeleine Albright's furious stare tracked his every move. During a video conference call from the UN mission in New York, his feet were propped up on a chair, while down in the White House Situation Room, their giant distortion completely filled the wall screen and so disrupted the meeting that President Clinton's National Security Advisor finally ordered a military aide to turn off the video feed. Holbrook put his feet up anywhere, in the White House, on other people's desks and coffee tables, for relief and for advantage. Near the end, it seemed as if all his troubles were collecting in his feet, atrial fibrillation, marital tension, thwarted ambition, conspiring colleagues, hundreds of thousands of air miles, corrupt foreign leaders, a war that would not yield to the relentless force of his will. But at the other extreme from his feet, his ice blue eyes were on perpetual alert. Their light told you that his intelligence was always awake and working. They captured nearly everything and gave almost nothing away. Like one-way mirrors, they looked outward, not inward. I never knew anyone quicker to size up a room, an adversary, a newspaper article, a set of variables in a complex situation, even his own imminent death. The ceaseless appraising told of a manic spirit churning somewhere within the low voice and languid limbs. Once in the 1980s, he was walking down Madison Avenue when an acquaintance passed him and called out, Hi, Dick. Holbrook watched the man go by, then turned to his companion. I wonder what he meant by that. Yes, his curly hair never obeyed the comb and his suit always looked rumpled and he couldn't stay off the phone or TV and he kept losing things and he ate as much food as fast as he could, once slicing open the tip of his nose on a clamshell and bleeding through a pair of cloth napkins. Yes, he was in almost every way a disorderly presence, but his eyes never lost focus. So much thought, so little inwardness. He could not be alone. He might have had to think about himself. Maybe that was something he couldn't afford to do. Leslie Gelb, Holbrook's friend of 45 years and recipient of multiple daily phone calls, would butt into a monologue and ask, what's Obama like? Holbrook would give a brilliant analysis of the president. How do you think you affect Obama? Holbrook had nothing to say. Where did it come from? that blind spot behind his eyes that masked his inner life. It was a great advantage over the rest of us because the propulsion from idea to action was never broken by self-scrutiny. It was also a great vulnerability. And in the end, it was fatal. I'm trying to think what to tell you now that you have me talking. There's too much to say and it all comes crowding in at once his ambition, his loyalty, his cruelty, his fragility, his betrayals, his wounds, his wives, his girlfriends, his sons, his lunches. By dying, he stood up a hundred people, including me. He could not be alone. If you're still interested, I can tell you what I know from the beginning. I wasn't one of his close friends, but over the years I made a study of him. You ask why? Not because he was extraordinary, though he was, and might have rivaled the record of his heroes if he and America had been in their prime together. Not because he was fascinating, though he was, and right this minute somewhere in the world, 14 people are talking about him. But I won't relate this story for his sake. No, we want to see and feel what happened to America during Holbrook's life. And we can see and feel more clearly by following someone who was almost great, because his quest leads us deeper down the alleyways of power than the usual famous subjects, whom he knew, all of them. And his boisterous struggling lays open more human truths than the composed annals of the great. This was what Les Gelb must have meant when he said just after his friend's death, 
far better to write a novel about Richard C. Holbrook than a biography, let alone an obituary. What's called the American century was really just a little more than half a century. And that was the span of Holbrook's life. It began with the Second World War and the creative bursts that followed the United Nations, the Atlantic Alliance, containment, the free world. And it went through dizzying lows and highs until it expired the day before yesterday. The thing that brings on doom to great powers and great men, is it simple hubris or decadence and squander, a kind of inattention, loss of faith, or just the passage of years? At some point, that thing set in, and so we are talking about an age gone by. It wasn't a golden age. There was plenty of folly and wrong, but I already miss it. The best about us was inseparable from the worst. Our feeling that we could do anything gave us the Marshall Plan and Vietnam, the peace at Dayton, and the endless Afghan war. Our confidence and energy, our reach and grasp, our excess and blindness, they were not so different from Holbrook's. He was our man. That's the reason to tell you this story. That's why I can't get his voice out of my head. Next slide, Julia. So he died in December 2010. And his death was dramatic because it took place in the office of Hillary Clinton at the State Department, the office he had always wanted to occupy and had never quite reached. And a few weeks later, his widow, Kati Martin, gave me his personal papers, no strings attached. And within a couple of weeks, they were sitting in my home office in those filing cabinets that you can see in that slide, totally dominating the room, making it hard to open the door. Holbrook was in my life and stayed there for the next seven years, uh, kind of hovering over me almost, resentful and wondering who the hell are you to be reading my diaries and my letters and what's taking you so long? Because it took me a long time to figure out what this book was about. Uh, it was not clear to me why we needed a book about Richard Holbrook. Yes, he was dazzling and dominating and irritating, um, and, but he never quite made it to the top. So why write about him? Well, one day I was driving in Connecticut and I suddenly heard a voice say, Holbrook, yes, I knew him. Those first lines that I just read to you. I suddenly realized that this would be a way to write a book about Richard Holbrook so that people would understand him from the inside and would want to hear his story. That narrative voice, the voice of the narrator you just heard is the only invention in the book. Everything else is fact. There's 30 pages of notes at the end, but that voice is an invention. In my feeling, it's not quite my voice. It's more like the voice of someone who somehow just knew this whole story without quite telling you how or why, and is giving it to you like a yarn over one very long night. You're hearing the story of Holbrook from someone who somehow has the authority to tell you because he knew the story and knew Holbrook and was an eyewitness to the whole saga. And so that quality of a yarn is to me what a novel feels like. And my goal was to write this book as if it were a novel, a novel about Richard Holbrook, in which you see him from the inside as well as the outside. And you also see his life and times, which were rich and fascinating. And it was really the period of the American century, which I think began the year he was born in 1941, the year that Henry Luce coined the term American century, the year the United States entered World War II. And we don't quite know when it ended, but it ended sometime around the time of Holbrook's death, when America began to recede as the, the global superpower. So that's the frame of the book. Let me tell you a bit about his career and who he was. He served in the State Department under every Democratic president from John F. Kennedy to Barack Obama. Um, next slide, Julia. He 
was according, Hillary Clinton once told me that he was the Zelig of American foreign policy because he kept appearing in the middle of the action, wherever the action was. Next slide. And the first action of his career was South Vietnam. His first post was in the Mekong Delta uh, in 1963 when the war was beginning to heat up. Um, and he was right in the thick of it. He was the senior American civilian at age 22, just imagine that, in an entire province that was dominated by the Viet Cong and was the epicenter of the war. So that was Holbrook's first job. It was a pretty exciting job for a 22 year old. He was thrilled to be in the middle of it. He wanted to see the action and he had this lifelong habit of wanting to get as close to the ground as he could. He was not the sort of diplomat who would be satisfied sitting at a desk and reading cables um, and getting briefings from people closer to the action. He wanted to see it and feel it himself in order to make up his mind. And that was sort of an instinct he had uh, similar to that of a journalist and in fact, he wanted to be a journalist before he became a diplomat. He couldn't get a job at the New York Times, so instead he went into the State Department. But he, throughout his career, loved the company of journalists, sought us out, tried to seduce us, tried to use us, and it simply enjoyed us because in a way it was closer to his own spirit to be among journalists than to be among government officials. Within a couple of weeks of arriving in the Mekong Delta, he realized two things. One, we were losing the war. And this was something very few people understood in 1963. But he knew we were losing because we were using firepower as if this was a conventional war. And we were turning innocent peasants, civilians caught in the middle into sympathizers with the Viet Cong. So we were fighting the war the wrong way. And the other reason, the other thing he learned right away was that we were lying to ourselves. He read the reports that the military personnel around him were sending up to Saigon and which went from Saigon to Washington. And they were full of wishful thinking and highly optimistic data that really didn't hold up under the pressure of reality, but that um, by the time it reached President Kennedy's desk, it bore no res resemblance to the truth. And Holbrook was appalled that the U.S. government was capable of this self-deception about something as important as a war. So he was really one of the very earliest to understand how a bureaucracy, especially that of a great power, could blunder into a, a war that it didn't know how to fight and didn't understand and then deceive itself into continuing until it got deeper and deeper and couldn't get out. He saw all of that. And that's the first part of the book is his time in Vietnam. Next slide, Julia. He also spent part of his time in Vietnam networking, schmoozing. He was an incredible operator. And here he is at age 22 on the tennis court in Saigon with Maxwell Taylor on the left and Stuart Alsop, the journalist in the center. Holbrook used tennis as a way to get close to powerful Americans like Maxwell Taylor, like William Westmoreland, and, and then eventually back in Washington with Bobby Kennedy, and to impress them with his knowledge and make himself indispensable to them so that they would promote him. So he very early on became a very upwardly mobile diplomat who managed to impress a lot of people and piss off a lot of people. And his detractors were just as numerous as his admirers because he had rough elbows and push people out of the way and let you know exactly what he thought of you. Uh, and could be, his ego was a thing uh, that people were appalled by because it just didn't seem to have any constraints or boundaries. He didn't behave like most people and pretend to be modest or pretend to be polite. Instead, he had this kind of unfiltered quality that, um, that made enemies and it haunted him for his entire life because people, his enemies became powerful and they were in a position to stop him. Next slide. Um, he was right in the middle of counterinsurgency training Vietnamese soldiers um, and beginning a 
a sequence of gradual disillusionment that he felt in the war, although it never, it only reached the point where he thought we could not win and should get out a few years later in 1967. Next slide. In 66, he went back to Washington and worked in the Johnson White House and continued to work on Vietnam and also continued his social climb through Washington, especially through Georgetown and made friends with very famous men of the American century. And they were almost entirely men such as Averill Harriman. And Harriman put him on the first delegation to peace talks with the North Vietnamese in Paris in 1968. And those talks went nowhere. And when Richard Nixon was elected, Holbrook temporarily got out of government and did some other things. He became the editor of Foreign Policy magazine. He became a Peace Corps country director. And he left his young wife with their two sons and became, next slide, Julia, a Washington swinger of the 1970s. Here he is on the phone at Foreign Policy. Um, he had lots of girlfriends in those years, and I, have a, I pay a lot of attention to his personal life because I think you can't write about a person like Holbrook without understanding him in full, without seeing him as a complete human being. Um, one of his girlfriends uh, he was a young woman, 10 years younger, and on a date, he suddenly proposed to her, and both of them were still married. So she thought this was a bit odd and to hold him off, she said, well, how do you see yourself in five years? And he said, I'll be the next Henry Kissinger. And this young woman actually knew Henry Kissinger. And that was the end of her relationship with uh, Richard Holbrook. Kissinger, by the way, once called Holbrook the most viperous man in this town, which is really very high praise coming from Kissinger. Next slide, at age 35, he became the youngest ever assistant secretary of state for East Asia. That was under Jimmy Carter. And here he is on the Great Wall of China. And in the middle is Vigniew Brzezinski. You might recognize him, who was Jimmy Carter's national security advisor. Brzezinski was Holbrooke's first real antagonist in government. And it was a bloody battle between them. Holbrooke wanted to get as much of the policy of normal, normalizing relations with the People's Republic of China as he could into the State Department. Brzezinski was trying to keep it in the White House and the two of them engaged in a fight that was petty and involved uh, Brzezinski leaving Holbrook out of meetings and out of talking points and consigning him to the back of motorcades and really humiliating him. And it was Holbrook's introduction to how brutal government work can be at the top level, where the egos and the power struggle and the ambition and the stakes are also so great. So in this picture, you can see that Holbrook, who's younger and less powerful than Brzezinski, is getting the worst of it. And Brzezinski looks pretty pleased with himself because he is winning in this war. Next slide. Between jobs in government, Holbrook then began working on Wall Street to make money. He had no interest in banking. Um, one of his colleagues once said the only two words in investment banking that Holbrook understood were annual bonus. But he wanted to make money. He wanted to be around wealthy and powerful people. And he was always waiting for that next shot at a great government job and at public service because that was what mattered to him was making a difference, being a statesman and actually having an effect on the world. Unlike a lot of people who go into government, he was not content to hold a powerful position. He really wanted to use it in order to change things. And the peak of his career came in the 90s when he became President Clinton's Assistant Secretary of State for Europe. So he was not rising bureaucratically. He's remaining at that second tier. But he used that job to end the worst bloodshed in Europe since World War II, the war in Bosnia and in the Balkans. And here he is at Dayton, where he brought all the combatants to an Air Force base outside Dayton, Ohio, um, and for three weeks forced them to sit and talk and yell and negotiate until he had a peace deal. It was not by any means a perfect peace, but it ended the war. 
And that was really Richard Holbrook's great claim to being a historic figure. He, more than anyone, was responsible for ending the war in the Balkans. Next slide. His last job in government was under Barack Obama. And look at the body language here in the Oval Office. Obama really couldn't stand Holbrook. He won't look at him here. Holbrook was everything Obama disliked in a government official. He was bombastic, he flattered, he lectured, he pontificated. And no drama Obama couldn't bear the continuous uh, noise and drama that Holbrook brought with him everywhere he went. Meanwhile, Joe Biden seems to be staring deaf rays at Richard Holbrook here in the Oval Office because the two of them knew each other well, were the same age, had served in government during the same decades, had the same views about everything, including Bosnia, and therefore, of course, they deeply disliked each other. So Holbrook was the odd man out in the Obama administration. He was appointed to be Obama's representative on Afghanistan, which was maybe the hardest foreign policy problem that Obama inherited. And he gave it to Holbrook, but didn't give Holbrook the power or the trust to solve that problem and try to end that war because he disliked him, didn't trust him. And Holbrook never understood why and couldn't ever make Obama want to be with him, even allow him into meetings or on Air Force One on trips to Afghanistan. Holbrook was left out and humiliated. And it really, I think, pretty much broke his heart. Um, and he died in December 2010, still hanging on to that job when his friends all were telling him to quit. And sitting in, an office, in Hillary Clinton's office, briefing her on Afghanistan when his aorta tore. And within an hour, he was in emergency surgery, which he never came out of, so alive. So his, his life, in a sense, ended in, in action, on the job, in the Secretary of State's office. Next slide. Um, his personal life, in some ways, was just as flamboyant and mesmerizing as his professional life. He, uh, he wanted to swallow life whole. Here he is with his girlfriend of seven years, Diane Sawyer, who uh, was exhausted by him and finally left him for Mike Nichols um, and for a more quiet life than he would give her. He was, um, let's say, a bit of a star. He loved being around celebrities. Next slide. Here he is with uh, Hakeem Olajuwon and Dikembe Mutombo, NBA players, when Holbrook became UN ambassador under Clinton. Next slide. Here he is with the Dalai Lama. I don't know if you can tell, but Holbrook is actually poking the Dalai Lama in the chest as he gives him his point of view. And next slide. And here he is with his buddy, Robert De Niro. Um, who he gave lots of advice to on script writing about politics. Um, he loved adventure. He loved gossip. He loved food. He saw more movies than most of us ever get to. His favorite was There's Something About Mary, which I find kind of endearing because it tells you he was not at all a snob. Um, he had lots of affairs. He was a sexist. But he only revealed himself really fully to women because he didn't see them in the same way as he saw men as competitors and threats. And so, again, the book has a lot about his three marriages, um, his third to Kati Martin, who is a journalist and every bit his equal um, and in some ways became his perfect match. Um, he, he never made it to the top. And the reason was himself. He, he had egotism and idealism, both in immense quantities. The egotism made people detest him. The idealism made people revere him. Sometimes they got out of whack. And when the egotism got to be too great, he blew up his own life chances. But when they were in the right balance, he really could achieve more than most people could hope to do in a whole lifetime in government. Next slide. But even though he spent his life among powerful and famous and successful people, I think he never listened more carefully to anyone than he is listening in this picture to a Pakistani refugee 
This is in 2010 during these horrific floods in Pakistan. And Holbrook, who cared about refugees all his life, made a point of getting the U.S. government to give aid to Pakistan and to get involved in saving these refugees. These were the kind of people that he was in government for. He was the son of refugees himself, Jewish refugees from Hitler and Stalin. And he had a lifelong passion for humanitarian causes. And once he got his teeth into a cause, he never let go. He was critical of the militarization of our foreign policy that he saw over the years from Vietnam to Afghanistan. But he also believed that America was a force for good and that America always had to get involved and to be in the lead, that problems would not go away and eventually would become our problems, even if they started far away from us, unless we became uh, the leaders of an international effort, cooperating with our friends, but in the lead. And who better to be the leader of the indispensable country than Richard Holbrook himself? At least that was his view. The results of this activism were as often harmful as they were helpful. This is a story that begins in Vietnam and ends in Afghanistan. Um, skip the next couple slides, Julia. Yeah, skip those. And there we go. Oh, back to that one. Yeah. Um, he was a diplomat, but this isn't really a book about foreign policy alone. It's a portrait of a whole era of American life, the era when America thought of itself as the leader of the free world. And here is Holbrook in old age. He's just a couple of months before his death. And what I want you to listen to for the end of this talk is a piece of an audio diary that he kept in those last months of his life on a cassette player, which were among the papers that I received shortly after his death. And this is not about Afghanistan or about Barack Obama. This is about going to hear the revival of South Pacific at Lincoln Center in the summer of 2010. And it tells you so much about Holbrook and how he saw the country and how he saw himself. So just listen to this couple minutes of his, of his audio diary. there 
corners of the globe and saved civilization. Slide, last slide. <clears throat> like Holbrook himself, the American century combined heroic and destructive impulses, nobility and hubris, the sense that we could do anything, the impulse to do everything. But I really only understood what my book was about six years after Holbrook's death on election night in 2016, when I suddenly realized that the era he embodied was over. We were entering something new, something diminished. And I suddenly understood that what I was writing was now history. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much. That was just, thank you for sharing your story. You're such an interesting person. Um, actually, before, we're open for Q&A now, and I'll actually start with one that came to us before we even started. Um, question from Tom asking, what, if anything, were you unable to find out about Holbrook that you wish you could have found out? Are there any unsolved mysteries? Mm. <laughs> well, I learned a lot. Um, I learned that his friendship with Anthony Lake, who was his year at the Foreign Service Institute and his best friend in Vietnam, and then became his enemy. And um, in the end, was in his way, both in the Bosnia years under Clinton and on, in the Obama years, um, because Lake was always a little bit ahead of Holbrook and used that advantage to make sure that Holbrook was kept in check. I, I, I could never quite figure out what happened between them. Why did their friendship turn so poisonous? And all I can tell you is it had something to do with Mrs. Lake. And I talked to all the survivors um, and the, the book tells the story, but it comes up short of absolutely solving the mystery because in some ways certain human stories deserve you know, to remain a bit hidden, but I tell it as, as, as much of it as I could because I think it had a real effect on Holbrook's life and on American public life because of this Hamilton and Burr kind of story of Holbrook and Lake, which is a big part of the book. Um, and again, so if anyone has any questions, you can submit them through the chat feature. But while you all think, um, I'd like to hear what you think because you knew him personally what he would think of your book. Hmm. He would be outraged by it in some ways. Um, he would be, he would also tell me how to write it and or rewrite it. He'd want to change the opening, change the ending. He, he had that kind of, you know, impertinence to let journalists know exactly what they had done wrong and how they should have done their work. I think he would have been really angry about some of the revelations of his life and perhaps maybe above all hurt by the phrase almost great, which is a phrase I use several times. He did really remarkable things. He never quite achieved the level he wanted. And he knew better than anyone that he hadn't done it, that he wanted both as a potential secretary of state and as a great figure in history. He didn't quite get there. But I also think he was smart enough and honest enough to, to know that I had done my best to do him justice. And I think in the end, he would have accepted that, even though there would have been a tremendous amount of grief and noise and anger along the way. Great. So we, um, I'm actually going to unmute Carl to ask a question. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if uh, what you learned about Holbrook and through him about the administrations in which he served uh, tells us anything about the end of the American century as far as it's evidenced in the rise of populism and nationalism mm -hmm. and a retreat from, uh, you know, some role greater in the world stage. That's a great question um, and one I've thought about a lot. Holbrook grew up uh, worshiping the architects of the post-war era, Dean Acheson, George Kedden, 
uh, Averill Harriman, Truman, Eisenhower. Um, and his DNA was that, that era. He couldn't imagine another world in which the United States wasn't um, leading some kind of alliance of, of great democracies. And yet at the same time, that world was ending throughout his life. The foreign policy establishment was losing its influence. Vietnam hastened that. And um, by the time Holbrook was in his prime, the public was beginning to be skeptical about people who claimed that you know, they were uh, somehow going to lead the country into great things without really getting the permission in some ways of the public. So I don't know that the American people wanted all the responsibility that Holbrook was ready to take on to solve all these wars and all these crises. And at the same time, Holbrook was entering into a political class that had a tinge of, I have to say, corruption to it. Um, he used his connections to, you know, get sweetheart loans and to sit on the board of AIG and to work at Lehman. And it, in some ways, he was eating at the table of a Washington Wall Street axis that was losing its um, authority. And he didn't see that. He assumed there would always be a place for the next Dean Acheson, who would be him. But I think that place was disappearing. And by the time Holbrook died, you could already see that two wars that had gone disastrously wrong, Iraq and Afghanistan, a financial crisis that had immiserated millions and millions of Americans, the, the public was just not going to trust these great men and great women at that point without you know, some kind of a return on investment. And so you could sort of begin to see the arrival of a, a different worldview in the form of Donald Trump who said, why the hell should we? Why should we get involved? What's in it for us? What's in it for you, the American people? That was a powerful argument that Trump made in 2016. I'm not sure Holbrook would have been able to answer it very well because in a way he hadn't seen that his world was disappearing even as he was uh, enjoying his great moments. Hope that answers your question, Carl. Thank you. And we have a question from Julie asking, can you please comment on how Holbrook's experience in Vietnam and others of his generation had an impact on our foreign policy going forward until today? Yes. I mean, Vietnam was the formative experience of his life and his generation's life. And he remained close to the friends he made in those years in a way that you remain close to people who you meet in the middle of some searing experience like Vietnam. Um, for some of them, the, the lesson of Vietnam was basically stay out. Don't try to do too much. Uh, be aware of the limits of our power. Um, and of our ability to do harm. For Holbrook, Vietnam was a mistake, and he knew all the reasons why we made those, that mistake. But he never lost his basic sense that we nonetheless had to be involved in the world's problems. Not always with our military. In fact, he was a skeptic of the military because he saw how uh, many mistakes it made and how self-deceiving it was in Vietnam and how the military managed to de deceive the civilian leaders um, with the reports of progress that were hollow. So Holbrook wasn't a militarist, but he was an activist in foreign policy and Vietnam did not slow him down. He did not really look back and say, we need to change our entire way of uh, behaving in the world. He took it as a lesson and he applied that lesson to Afghanistan, which was a very similar kind of war. Barack Obama didn't want to hear about Vietnam from Richard Holbrook. It was one of the sore spots. And so when Holbrook would start telling stories about the Johnson White House, Barack Obama would turn to the people in the Situation Room table and say, who talks like this? And then he would tell his aides to tell Holbrook to shut up. So that was part of the tragedy of, of that relationship. It went back to Vietnam, which Holbrook thought 
had some lessons that we needed to learn and that Obama, for one reason or another, just didn't want to hear, at least not from Richard Holbrook. And speaking of professional relationships, um, Joseph is asking, what was the emotional temperature of his relationship with Mrs. Clinton? Very warm. They were real friends. In fact, I think I can say they loved each other in the sense that they were affectionate. They enjoyed each other's company. Um, they laughed a lot. She needed him for his strategic mind and his foreign policy experience. He needed her because under Obama, she was his only friend and patron in that administration. And she saved his job more than once when Obama was about to fire him, which, is, which are stories that I tell in the book in detail. Um, and when he died, she was grief stricken um, and continued to talk about him and to remain close to his staff and for years afterward, and when I, I went to interview him, I, sorry, I went to interview her about him just before the 2016 campaign got underway, and she gave me a lot of time because she said to me, I want to make sure he gets his due. So unlike Bill Clinton, who Holbrook didn't care for as much, maybe they were a little too much alike, uh, Hillary Clinton and he were real friends, and, and it's a uh, one of the sort of the bright and soft spots in his career that um, two very powerful and in some ways difficult people could have such a, in a way, a simple and uh, uncomplicated relationship. That makes it doubly terrible that he passed in front of her then. Absolutely. I mean, he was sitting three feet from her telling her about the beginning of his effort to begin to uh, create a channel to talk to the Taliban, which was his main contribution to the war effort, which was the insight that we couldn't win and we needed to negotiate. And she was skeptical of that, but she was willing to let him try. And he was sitting there telling her about the first meeting with the Taliban when suddenly his face turned a kind of cartoonish shade of red and he stood up. And Hillary said, my God, Richard, what's happening to you? And he said, I don't know. I, I've never felt this way. I'm feeling something terrible. And she immediately made sure that he got an ambulance to the hospital. And she checked in all the time. And she was the one who announced the news of his death to his staff, who really were devoted to him, these younger Foreign Service officers, absolutely uh, devoted to him. And she hugged them, and they cried. And so she was there sort of as the mother figure for all these young uh, State Department people when they lost their, their boss and she lost her friend. So a question from Edward asking, uh, what are we to make of Holbrook's role in the Valerie Plame matter? How did his involvement as Mr. Novak's source ultimately come to light? No, he wasn't. He, he was not Novak's source. Um, that was Colin Powell's deputy, Richard Armitage. Um, so Holbrook was out of government during the Iraq war. He, uh, supported the war and did it, I would say, for fairly crude political reasons. He thought if he was going to ever get to be secretary of state, he had to, he had to be for that war. And in fact, I tell the story of a scene in his apartment in 2002, when John Kerry came to see Holbrook in Manhattan at his apartment and let him know that he that Kerry was thinking of running for president in 2004. And Holbrook said, if you're going to run, you have to be for the war resolution. So there was a, a kind of, and that was one of the great mistakes of Holbrook's life, I think, was to take a political stance on, on a war that he probably knew better than to support. But that wasn't Holbrook who leaked the plane uh, story. Um, a question from Luciana asking, what was his track record at the United Nations? It was amazing. He only spent, I think, 18 months, maybe even 15 months, because some scandals held up his confirmation. There was some financial skullduggery that had to be cleared up before the Senate could confirm him. But once he was confirmed, I don't think any UN ambassador has ever achieved more in less time. And among other things, we were about to lose our seat at the General Assembly in the year 2000 because we had stopped paying our dues 
Jesse Helms was holding them up because he didn't like the United Nations. Holbrook came in and lobbied every Republican member of Congress and every foreign UN ambassador. That must be something close to 400 people, all of them skeptical of the other, and got them to sign off on an agreement where we would lower our dues, the UN would agree to certain reforms, and in exchange, we would pay back what we owed and we would remain in good standing. It's very little known, it's kind of an obscure thing, but he saved our seat at the UN. And it was an astounding feat of diplomacy to do that. He also um, got involved in a lot of African issues. He tried to negotiate the end of the war in Congo, did not succeed, but he also put HIV AIDS as an issue before the UN Security Council, as an issue of global security. The first time a disease had ever been made into an issue for the UN itself, because he had seen the effect it was having on African countries. And in a way, you just, you could think, what if, what if Holbrook were at the UN today or in the State Department today? How would the United States be dealing with the global pandemic? if Holbrook had had the chance to create a coalition of countries and of, of actors in order to make this something the world was trying to solve together rather than doing it in a way that undermined other countries and pushed our allies away and made our relationship with China into a new Cold War. It's interesting to think what Holbrook would do if he had lived to see the coronavirus. Um, and you speak to more about why the Dayton Accords were so extraordinary and challenging. And can you comment on Bill Clinton's leadership in this and how Holbrook interacted with President Clinton on this issue? Yeah, it's quite interesting. I mean, Holbrook and Clinton understood each other. They were two rogues. They were two bad boys. Um, and Clinton enjoyed Holbrook's company because Holbrook, you know, had that rough around the edges quality that Clinton seemed to admire in other men, something that was not true when it came to Barack Obama. Um, so Clinton was happy to give Holbrook the bag to carry in trying to negotiate the end of that war. The story I tell in the book of the Bosnia War does not put Clinton in a good light. He spent two and a half years doing everything he could to keep the United States out of that war. And meanwhile, 100,000 or more people died, some of them in acts of genocide, some of the worst slaughter of the last half century. Um, I think Clinton does not come out very well from Bosnia. But finally, in the summer of 95, after the Srebrenica massacres made it impossible to stay away, um, he allowed Holbrook to begin this shuttle diplomacy around the three Balkan capitals, Sarajevo, Belgrade, Zagreb. And that was Holbrook in his element and in his prime. Uh, and Holbrook had something of the quality of a rough Balkan warlord himself. So he understood these guys and knew how to corner them and how to prevent them from bluffing him and cornering him. And he was in some ways just the right person, that combination of idealism and toughness. Um, Dayton was a three week nightmare. It almost failed. Everyone was about to go home because these three warring parties were so bitter and there had been so much death that they just were not prepared to say, fine, we will stop shooting. And in the end, it was Slobodan Milosevic, not Richard Holbrook, who was the key figure. He wanted the war to end. It was kind of killing his uh, power in, in Serbia. So he was the one who was willing to give up the things that had to be given up in order to get a deal. Holbrook was practically you know, laid flat by his own efforts. It was such a high wire act to bring them together and try to negotiate this deal in a very claustrophobic and unglamorous military base, but he got it done. And it kind of saved Clinton because Clinton then could go into the 96 election with a foreign policy success story, which was Bosnia. Because once the United States got involved, 
militarily, there were no American casualties, not one, which is a remarkable, um, remarkable thing. Except, and this is a very important story in the book, three of Holbrook's closest colleagues, diplomats, civilians, two of them, one was military, died in an armored personnel carrier that rolled off the mountain as they were heading into Sarajevo during the negotiations. Holbrook was in the other vehicle and survived. And that story is one I tell in great detail. And it was one of the key moments in Holbrook's career. Um, so we have an additional question from Julie asking, can you comment on the tragic weaknesses of Holbrook's personality, such as mentioned dissembling about taking credit for saving the guy in the car crash? Yeah, so Julie, you've read it, thank you. Um, he told the story of that accident in his book on Bosnia to end the war, it's the opening scene. And he told it in a way that made him, in some ways, the hero and central figure, when in fact he was utterly a bystander, which is not a disgrace. He was the senior diplomat. It was a young lieutenant colonel who was in Holbrook's vehicle who risked his life to save the lives of the people who were in the, the armor personnel carrier that had rolled down the mountain. Holbrook wrote him out of the story in a way that is really hard to forgive. And there's so many other incidents in the book where Holbrook is moving around place cards at a dinner following a funeral so that he can sit next to the right person and schmooze them. I mean, and that was just a, a, a normal day in the life of Richard Holbrook. He had, no, as I said, he just didn't have the restraints that some people might have in knowing what's, what isn't done. And why, what was that? I think it was, uh, as I wrote in the prologue, that inability to see himself as others saw him. He somehow thought he was pulling something on people when in fact they could see straight through him. There were no great mysteries about Richard Holbrook. It was all right there in your face. And somehow he was missing that quality of self-consciousness that most people have, which allows them to understand why they are alienating Barack Obama or why you don't lie about your role in a tragic accident in a war. And Holbrook didn't have that. And it really cost him because the people he antagonized were powerful people and were in a position to stop him. The reason he did not become Secretary of State were those very uh, qualities that, that Julie mentioned, the dissembling, the lying. Bill Clinton said to Al Gore, when Clinton was trying to decide whether it should be Holbrook or Madeleine Albright as his Secretary of State in 1996, Clinton said to Gore, I, I just don't think Holbrook has the self-awareness to keep his relationships from becoming toxic. And that shows you how shrewd an observer Bill Clinton was, because that, that nails Holbrook dead to rights, and that's why Holbrook didn't become his Secretary of State. Um, so I think for the last question, um, we had a question from Amy, which I think I'll reword a little bit. So I think this came from your statement about how things changed in 2016. So in your perspective, where do you see America relative to world leadership now and in the future? We've abandoned it. We've, we have left our post. Um, the, the world does not look to us for leadership. It's not as though, I don't think that our performance during the pandemic has been a great disappointment because the, that's no longer the expectation. We are no longer expected to be the country that contributes more money to the World Health Organization in spite of its flaws because the world needs the WHO more than ever right now. We're, we're no longer that country and so the world no longer looks to us for that role. And instead there's almost a quality, and this is something I've heard from people who, who've been reading my work around the world, there's a quality of just sadness. Um, and even, I hate to say this, but even pity that Americans are um, living in this terrible time under leadership that is, makes a virtue of ignorance and of, um, of division and of hatred um, and looks for enemies and looks for people to blame and doesn't look for cooperation in order to solve a problem, which is, if anything, is a human problem. This pandemic is a human problem, but instead our leaders have made it into 
um, a national problem or a, a nationalist problem. And that's tragic because first, we, we cannot fight it that way. And second, we've lost so much of our prestige. My feeling is, and I'll be very blunt about this, if, if Donald Trump uh, loses in the fall, we'll never go back to being the country Richard Holbrook uh, thought we were. That era is over, but we can restore some of our credit and the goodwill of the, the world. But if he wins a second term, I think that becomes a permanent condition and we will never really recover. You know, we, things will move on, will change, but we'll, in some ways that will become a permanent condition. Wow, well, I, I hate to end on a negative note. Um, do you have any other interesting stories you'd like to share? <laughs> um, what can I say about Richard Holbrook? Um, I'll, I'll tell one last story if, if there's time. Yes. Um, this is both the worst of him and the best of him. So in 1995, he was in Poland as the Assistant Secretary for Europe, negotiating the expansion of NATO. And he heard from a young diplomat in Warsaw, American diplomat, that there was going to be a ceremony at Auschwitz uh, that week celebrating the 50th anniversary of the liberation of the camp. And the American delegation was just about to arrive and it will be led by Elie Wiesel, whom Holbrook knew. Holbrook was outraged that he had not been invited to participate in the ceremony. There was no reason why he should. They didn't know he was gonna be in Poland, Auschwitz wasn't, you know, but he couldn't handle that. So he got himself down to Krakow which is near Auschwitz, and basically pushed his way onto the American bus that was leaving from the, consul, from the consulate to the camp that morning. And this elderly couple of Americans who had met at Auschwitz as prisoners and married afterward and were part of the official delegation lost their seat on the bus to Richard Holbrook. Uh, and when they didn't know that it was Holbrook who'd taken their seat. They just knew that the bus was full up. And when this young diplomat told Holbrook, Mr. Ambassador, you really have to give up your seat. It's for this survivor couple who are part of the delegation. Holbrook just would not move. And there you see him at his absolute worst, just a, a, a sense of entitlement and his ego trampling on any human decency. So bus went to the camp. Holbrook sat on stage next to Elie Wiesel. This elderly couple had to find their own way to Auschwitz and to beg the Polish guards to let them, this is the irony that just about kills me, into the camp so that they could get to the ceremony in time. So they didn't know that Holbrook was the asshole who had done this. After the ceremony, Holbrook asked to be introduced to them. And in 45 minutes, he so charmed them and moved them by his interest in their lives and asked them all these questions about what their life in the camps was like. And could you show me around and tell me where you stayed and tell me where you ate and, and was truly interested because that was also Holbrook. By the end of those 45 minutes, that couple thought he was the most wonderful American diplomat they'd ever met and they all hugged. And that was the end of that, except that they never found out that Holbrook had done this terrible thing. So there you have him in a nutshell in one story. And I think that is a great place to end. So thank you so much. Um, as Tom said in the chat, this has been absolutely superb. And thank you so much for taking the time to share this all with us today. Yeah, I thank everyone for joining us. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for all. your help. Yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. We will see you at one of our upcoming events. There's lots on the calendar. And until then, stay home, stay safe, stay connected, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>